partner with Interactive Broadband Consulting Group. We are a boutique consulting firm that focuses on cable, mobile, and, and media space. And we just conducted uh, an elaborate research on this on-demand space and uh, learned that it's actually emerging quite rapidly. Um, the cable companies are claiming about 15 to 20 percent reduction in attrition as a result of on-demand uh, from a VOD perspective. In addition to that, there's an emergence of additional concepts of on-demand video on broadband television, which is uh, internet-based platforms, as well as mobile. So I think we'd love to talk about different areas of that, different aspects of it, both from a cable's perspective, as well as broadband and mobile's perspective, and then share the views that uh, the, the customers, the, the consumers, the advertisers, and the technology players and their role in the environment. Uh, if you don't mind, start uh, talk, introduce yourself a little bit, uh, your company, and what's the role that you play in the on-demand environment? Hi, I am Dmitry Panamaryov, and I uh, run TV Guide Spot, TV Guide's on-demand uh, network. And uh, I've been with TV Guide for about three years. Uh, start, started there in strat planning, and then moved on to the uh, gambling network uh, that TV Guide owns, called TVG and ran um, an interactive gambling business. And now I'm back with uh, the mothership running uh, TV Guide's on-demand network that basically focuses on guidance and letting consumers na navigate all the linear and on-demand choices uh, that they have available to them on TV and online. Thanks, Dimitri. I just wanted to know, we have a, do we have a quorum here? Uh, are we allowed to proceed with the festivities? Okay. Um, my name is Tim Hanlon. I uh, work for a unit of publicist group called Denuo, which is, uh, or if you're Latin, Denu. Uh, I, I've heard it pronounced many different ways. If anybody here speaks Latin, please see me after the, after the show. Um, it is a uh, new media futures practice, uh, just launched a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I run a, uh, a, an area called Ventures for that, that unit. But uh, prior to that, uh, and frankly still, uh, have had a hand in some of the nascent advertising models in and around things like video on demand. Um, I can tell you that uh, over the last few years I've been, uh, I've gone from uh, exceedingly optimistic to, mm, shall we say, less than sanguine. Um, I'd love to get back to that previous space and we can chat about the ways we can get there, I guess. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve Canepa, I'm responsible for IBM's uh, global media and entertainment industry business. Uh, we have a very broad uh, spectrum of things we do in the marketplace around media and entertainment from uh, core technology, leveraging research and development and you know, creating open standards and thing, you know, technology around encoding content or metadata, things like that, to uh, strategy work with firms in the industry around how they are going to uh, continue to extend their business models to uh, integration, helping them actually put those models into practice, uh, you know, integrating operations uh, into their infrastructure. And then finally through operations, actually taking responsibility for managing ways that, uh, that the media and entertainment industry goes to market, and which includes things like video on demand. So, uh, pleasure to be here. Well, half the things I know about media I learned from Steve when I worked at IBM. <laughs> he was my mentor there, so <laughs> glad to have him on the panel. Thanks. And I also worked for IBM, just for the record. <laughs> I have never worked for IBM, but, <laughs> but I think we do. But have you're a, willing to learn, right? But, but we do have we do have a quorum now, so <laughs> please go ahead. Thanks, Will. Uh, my name is Will Griffin. I'm a CEO of a company called DLD, which is an acronym for what's well, called Deaf on Demand. Uh, historically, I'm an entrepreneur and a producer. My partners in my business is Russell Simmons, who's probably the you know the top player in our culture, and Stan Lathan has produced more urban television than anybody, and so we spun off. Uh, this company to go after the on-demand and broadband opportunities. So right now we're on Comcast. We go up on Cox this summer, and hopefully we'll knock down Cablevision, Time Warner, and pretty soon. And we talked to actually Tim Hanlon was one of the early guys we talked to when we were launching the company, uh, and we were able to some way or another knock down General Motors and, and Coke out of his company. So. Because you know I am, really, I'm down with, I'm hip hop all the way, you know that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, right. I know it's that for in sure. my blood, you know that. And I was look, hoping you, you we weren't the, the reason why he was less sanguine. <laughs> 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 you, were, you, were, you were not the reason, I assure you. Speaking of hip hop, uh, we have Scott Campbell here as well. There we go. I don't, I, I don't know what the link is there, but <laughs> hi. 
but I'm, I'm prepared to learn. Um, hi, I'm Scott Campbell. I, I work with the British government uh, based in New York as their uh, digital media sector specialist. And um, UK Trade and Investment, for those of you who don't know, is our, the, the British government's economic development agency. We help British companies do business in the US and we help US companies set up in the UK. So um, I particularly work across radio, television, music, games, web and wireless. Uh, particularly with digital content, so I was thrown on this panel, hence the, the handwritten name panel here, but uh, looking forward to speaking about some of the experiences the UK has with uh, you know, uh, mobile telephone, we've got over 100% penetration in the UK, um, digital television, we've been launching um, you know, various different formats in the UK over the last five years, uh, including digital terrestrial television, which has had incredible success in the UK. Um, you know, with uh, that being free to air, so it kind of supports the old business model of advertising, paying for television programming, uh, which is interesting. It's eaten into to Sky, uh, the UK satellite provider's uh, market share by some 20% in the last couple of years. Cable has come down to the, the smallest market share in the UK. We've got something like 17% um, uh, of the population now use cable, which is, uh, you know, which is very different to the situation in the US, so hopefully I can bring some international perspective to the panel. So Thanks, and I, I love Scott's uh, accent, so I wanted to make sure he's on the panel. Um, so let's talk about on-demand from a cable perspective. Obviously, cable companies love on-demand, but uh, what, what do you think are the uh, views on on-demand from a consumer's point of view as well as from an advertiser's point of view? Do you want to start, Dimitri? Uh, sure. You know, I think that for, uh, I, I run TV Guide Spot, which is kind of the, essentially the on-demand business of TV Guide channel. And so the objective, I guess, for us is, in terms of programming, is, is dual. We want to provide guidance to people, but we also want to be uh, an extension of TV Guide channel's uh, better content. And so, you know, my role is to kind of marry the two objectives. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's tough to create shows that, uh, that meet both at the same time, right? And then uh, on top of that, I've got to build a profitable business. So there's definitely a lot of things to juggle. And uh, marketing is, and kind of trying to promote the business, get people to, in fact, um, learn about it, sample it, and, and come back is really the toughest, uh, the toughest thing to do for me right now. Uh, you want to go down the line, or do you want people to Tim, you have some views around sure, advertising. Sure, why not? Um, so I, I, uh, it's ironic, right? TV Guide, uh, you know, being one of the more active players in, in uh, cable delivered video on demand, yet the guidance and navigation largely for VOD is uh, pretty poor. I think we could all agree. Um, and I had no way to go to watch our words carefully because this actually is going to be a selection on charters on demand offerings. So uh, congratulations to all at home who actually found this. Um, the, the challenge, right, is to, you know, with, in, in a world where there's literally hundreds or thousands of hours of available uh, content in an on-demand fashion, uh, that's where it eventually gets to, um, how do you manage uh, that? How do you as a consumer find all that stuff? How are you able to find it? How do you perhaps search for it, perhaps get recommended it, perhaps some other than grid-based navigational schemes? Uh, that's a huge issue, and um, that's a challenge not only for programmers to get found and consumed and sampled and whatnot, but obviously any of the advertisers that come along for that ride want to be found too. So uh, it's a multi-layered uh, issue uh, with on-demand, but, but for, for to start, I would say guidance and navigation has to improve not quickly, but it, it, uh, of an order, uh, maybe two or three orders better than it is today, or it risks being um, uh, sort of left at the dock before it even sort of takes off, really. So do you think the cable companies are doing something about it? Oh, I, I think the cable operators are, are, are doing quite a bit. I, I know t TV Guide has a joint venture with Comcast called Guideworks. Uh, that is part of what we think the solution will be. But uh, with all due respect, while we wait for the cable industry to sort of, or the cable operators to get going faster with this stuff and and we'll come let's come back to the business model issue like how advertising fits in because that's another big big deal in my mind um uh broadband video is already taking off uh and then some so while we wait to perfect vod and tinker with it in a sort of uh, slow laborious process broadband video is exploding right, right. so uh and advertisers are flocking to that so we'll talk about that when the time's right 
Steve, uh, I know that IBM did an amazing white paper on this whole topic, the end of television, and it broke down different uh, demographics as part of it. Now, my four-year-old son, his on-demand is part of the vocabulary. He comes to me and he says, I'd like to watch something on demand. So he's growing up with it. It's a very, very different demographic than my father or my grandfather. Right. So we, what's your view on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, a comment. We just published a paper um, that's available, if you haven't seen it, called The End of Television as We Know It. Um, and uh, it, it basically came out of about a year-long study we did uh, speaking to um, senior executives from across the industry in, in all geographies around the world, uh, a number of analysts and then uh, folks who in some way are involved in the ecosystem around media and entertainment. And the, the point that uh, Shid was just referring to um, was that we, we basically, I mean, there's some, I guess, nuanced subtlety to it, but we came out and said, you know, the, the core demographic obviously is what we'd all call massive passives, you know, folks that are used to lean back television experience and may indeed evolve themselves to, you know, with the proper navigation tools, you know, select some video on demand, maybe even subscribe to an SVOD service. Um, but the growing uh, demographic really is, we broke it into two camps, one called gadgeteers, and the idea being, you know, like uh, Shahid's uh, child and, and all of our kids, um, they're, they're accustomed to the notion that they can use, uh, you know, next generation devices to access content in an unprogrammed form. So um, we talked a little bit about what's driving the gadgeteers and, and what's driving and how that's driving the marketplace. And then we talked about cool kids, which is kind of the other demographic, which is folks who have a lot of time and little money, but they tend to really be um, where the incubation for some of these new business models is happening. And so the study talked a little bit about all of these various forces that are at work and, and what impact they're having. I, I myself um, uh, have been uh, uh, a huge believer in uh, kind of distinguishing between streamed media and what I refer to as object distribution um, for quite some time for both um, long form or short form programming, but also for the advertising. And I think we're starting to see um, how an ob a, a world driven by object distribution can really change the way the video on demand is structured. Um, and, and I think that's really kind of the key driving um, force that, that we're going to see in the marketplace. And I, I'll, I'll come back with a few thoughts in a little bit on, on how I think that's going to play out. Well, I mean, I'm going through this experience, obviously, real time, painfully, you know, on the part of the programmer and as an entrepreneur. I think the big problem or the big challenge is that as it relates to VOD and cable, there really is no market maker, right? There's no one who says, here, we're going to set the table for all the players. So the cable company didn't say, hey, we're, this is what we're going to do for the consumer. We're going to have search. We're going to have specialty guides. We're going to tell them how they get to it. We're going to show them how this is value add over DBS or whatever. So they don't have the customer pitch. Then the second thing that doesn't happen is they don't have dynamic ad insertion. So you don't have the advertiser pitch either because not only do you not make sure you can aggregate the right demos and eyeballs for people, for the advertiser, you don't even have a way in order to deliver their message or take it down on the time frame that they want it because you have to bake the ads on. Third part is there's no money for the programmer, right? So they don't pay the programmers to create any good content, so then there's no incentive for the entrepreneur to get in the space because the advertisers don't put up money uh, because it's an unstable environment. I mean, so you're essentially saying here's the, one of the greatest opportunities for cable, at least that's the way they sold it to Wall Street. Wall Street didn't buy it, which is why the stocks are not growing because they haven't delivered on that promise. So they sell it to everybody and there's no real market maker. So what we're left to do is we, you know, programmers have to get together with advertisers and say, look, we're going to try to become our market makers. I, you know my challenge at cable. I'm essentially telling you make a venture deal. Here is our company's track record. We haven't quit any business. We tried to ride it out. And every other media, we're number one. We believe that when the table is set, we're going to be able to run that table. But right now, it's an unstable environment. So that's pushing us to do other things. I, you know, I don't know, sanguine is my, you know, what, you know, not to take Tim's word, but, you know, it's making us, hus you know, more hustlers. Now we have to say, all right, where is this repository of content that we have access to or we have control over? Where can we put that where there is a market and we have the opportunity to monetize it? So it drives us to other places, whether that's broadband video. So now I'm in a position that I have to go back to my partners at this point who are the sponsors and I have to say, listen, 
here's the content, the demo, the promise is still there. The challenge is that cable. We feel like ultimately that'll happen, right? But here's what we're doing to fulfill the promise, and we need you to ride along with us a little longer um, than we anticipated in the beginning, and you have to look at this more as a venture situation uh, that ultimately will pay off for you, you know, in the long run, and hopefully that far sided enough to buy into it. You know what, and, and um, I, you know, I'll be even more blunt. The, the reality is their VOD in a cable world is a zero billion dollar advertising business right now, okay? Right. Um, there's a lot of great content out there and folks like, like Will and, and, and bigger players like TV Guide and even bigger players than them, um, you know, who are trying very quickly to get their content into as many different environments as possible as consumers move much more rapidly than the media industry, right? Consumers want to get stuff in their own time, their own space, right? So whether that's be a, 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 a business friendly or perhaps even illegal peer-to-peer -peer environment or a broadband video environment or an MP3 or whatever, whatever the, the mechanism might be. And, it's, it's, um, it, and if I'm a content owner today, look, you wanna make sure that you are providing content across as many legitimate, hopefully measurable environments as possible so that consumers can get your stuff, hopefully in a legal and, uh, in a legal and um, uh, appealing way, and advertisers are gonna be jazzed by that. Data, extremely important in all of that. Um, unfortunately, none of that's happening really nearly as fast as it should in the cable VOD space, which is ironic, because we've been trying for, I don't know, going on five, six years now, trying to retrofit a movie delivery system into an ad-supported TV content uh, service. And it's still not there yet. And with all due respect, the, the major problem in this equation ain't the programmers, and it's certainly not the advertisers. So the only people that are left are the providers, the cable operators, and that's a problem. They're the ones that are not providing access to data that makes it appealing to advertisers. They're the ones that are not uh, allowing programmers to get paid for their content or even get the data themselves so they can sell it as an ad-supported business. Sounds like a great business to me. It isn't. It's unfortunate, but it isn't. And I, you know, I share Will's uh, uh, less than sanguinity, if that's the word, um, or sanguineness. Look, I, I didn't bring my thesaurus. Um, in that, it, this is a tremendously uh, po a great potential for ad-supported business because we, in theory, could track it, measure it, and deliver stuff that consumers actually really want. The irony is that that exact scenario is playing out right now in broadband video. So we don't have the middleman to deal with. We get access to the data. Programmers and advertisers can cozy up. We can see who's doing what, and we can go to market very quickly. And you know that, that retrofitting that you're doing now is, is gonna be well worth it because that's where it's seemingly right now most of the action is. And you know it's unfortunate, but that's the way it's going. So Tim, how do you feel about the cable companies? Just kidding. <laughs> I, look, I, look I, I will tell you, there's, there's some people here in the ad business who, uh, in this audience who, who know what we've been going through. Um, you know, we put out about uh, almost two years ago now, the 4A's uh, Advanced Television Committee put out Measurement guidelines, initial, iterative, malleable, measurement guidelines, ex minimum expectation sets for what it would take for advertisers to jump in with both feet in the advertising platform for VOD. And the problem is that we're still not even close. I think maybe not even a sixth of those data points are now met by the cable operators. Okay, you know what? If you're, gonna wait, if you're, if you're not going to provide the data that's necessary to judge whether advertising and programming is being delivered to a consumer like we can do in broadband video, why waste the time? We can go to broadband video, and we are in, in spades. I have to join Jim really quick and, and chime in that I think the MSOs must also do more to market uh, VOD. They really are not doing a lot, and I'm running the risk here of retribution, so hopefully I can get away with saying these things. But uh, today, if you go to a major MSO, they have two ways in their sort of strategic plan of how to market uh, VOD. One is to do it in the VOD barker, so you already need to know that there's a VOD service to know, to, to access the bark as a consumer. And then the other way is you know, they're telling the linear networks, you know, you've got to promote VOD in your linear network. We need you to put spots in, mentions by talent, you know, mortises, all these sorts of things. And if you are a startup network and you don't have a VOD presence, then you only have this sort of hope of being in, in, the, in the VOD barker, and that's just simply not enough. Right. And we, and we spend money, you know, we buy, you know, 200 cross-channel spots a month across the Oh, Comcast footprint, we do radio, we do street teams, we do PR. I mean, we do all the things that you'd want to do, but the problem is 
Well, many problems. The Comcat, uh, the operator, doesn't look at VOD as the killer app that it has the potential to be. So it's not staffed, you know, in the way that you would expect a killer app to be. They don't cozy up with programmers in the way that they do on the linear networks. And I, I, my theory is, that, and people who are in cable, it goes back to the fact that every few years ESPN hits them up for another rate hike. HB, HBO hits them up for a better split every few years. So they want a top-down approach. They don't want to be closely partnered up with programmers or promote certain programmers so that they get so big that then they have to start paying for the content. You know, ultimately, I think that's a big part of it, the phobia of creating another ESPN or two or three in VOD, you know, that's in studio stuff that you can get cross-platform. Challenge is going to be the existing media companies, and you're, you start out with the question of who's going to be the winners. I can't say who the winner, but I can tell you definitely who's the loser. The loser is the linear network channel that's ad supported. The reason why is because in the last two years, two things have happened. One is v VOD has come online you know, for a lot of users. Billions of hours a year of viewership and usage. Broadband video has exploded. Billions of hours a year, you know, even on these tens of millions you know, small bases. The Nielsen ratings still say that people watch basic cable and television the exact same amount over the last two years. It is impossible for there to be billions of hours worth of consumption in VOD and billions of hours worth of consumption on broadband video and the Nielsen's numbers and people still watching linear television exact same amount. It's don't, don't tell me you trust those numbers. That's our other study, the 36-hour day. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. So, there's a, so, so that's impossible to be true. Ultimately, what's going to happen is all the people who are in charge of keeping the networks honest, which primarily are the sponsors, are going to say, are going to get into the game, you know, kind of what Tim's company is starting to do and others are starting to trying to do. They're trying to get closer to these ventures. They're trying to get closer to the media consumption of the consumers so that they have the ability to track and then go back to those hundreds of billions of dollars worth of media investments that they're making in television and say, two things can't occupy the same space at the same time. We're not getting the bang for our buck in these channels. So all, mo the majority of the money for these new billions of hours worth of video consumption in these other media, most of that is going to come from the existing linear networks. Where I thought you were going to go, and actually maybe an, ad an additive point to that, is that um, you know there's an old adage in advertising, right? And that is you don't know which ad. Well, no, I'm not. No, I'm not going to beat that John Wanamaker <laughs> quote to a, to a pulp, right? Which is overly done. But it's um, that which gets measured gets bought. Okay. Now the strange part of that is that the measurement tools that we've used for historically mass media offerings are relatively crude instruments. Nielsen being the prime example. Um, you know the linear television rating system based on a five or eight or 10,000 home sample and then projecting that across the entire United States with now hundreds of digital linear channels to choose from and thousands of hours of on-demand programming to choose from and you know scores of hours of on-demand uh, content from a DVR environment and God knows what crosses the transom from broadband into the TV set eventually. Um, you can't tell me that a system largely devised in the mid-50s to measure a handful of linear television channels is going to keep up with that. It's just, you, you talk about impossible, that's not possible. Um, and frankly, advertisers are, are, are starting to recognize that those, those crude measurement environments are just not going to tell the, the true story about what's being delivered, what's being seen, what's being consumed. So, you know, I think we're entering into an era or a, a, of a transparency. Uh, media transparency. Um, it's happening in all businesses, right? But it's, it's media's turn, um, and, and video specifically, where we're going to know what people watch. Not necessarily individual, down to the minute, uh, violating per people's personal privacy. I, I'm not advocating that, nor do I, I, I wish for that. Um, I do think, though, that you're going to see much more granularity. Let's call it... Um, um, well, more granularity, maybe uh, aggregated to a point, but more granulated than we have today via Nielsen rating, for example, where we're going to tell, in, maybe in clusters or Zip Plus Four clusters or whatever, how people are consuming, how people are watching, what audience was delivered. Ironically, the, the data that we put out two years ago with the four A's for video on demand. 
it's not a rating. It's, it's an actual usage number. So can we get to that actual usage number? And when those numbers start to come in, as we're seeing in broadband video now, that's a marketplace. For an advertiser, that's a marketplace. And interestingly, a very targetable and malleable marketplace where we can put you know, relevant messages, things that aren't going to piss people off. Um, it's incumbent upon our business, the agency business, both media agencies, creative agencies, and the clients that, that hire us, to, to, to create ad messaging that's more malleable, more volum not voluminous, but in, in more uh, numerous forms for all these digital nooks and crannies, and then do our best job to target those messages properly so that we are hitting the right audiences, not bothered with the audiences that don't care, and starting with your point, actually help keep the cost of delivering this cool stuff in check. It's a whole nother, whole nother wrap here, but there's a digital cost to one's life today. And you add up all your digital subscriptions and your music subscriptions and your Netflix, and it, it adds up. Just go home and add up all your, 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 your cell phone, your cable, how much you pay for media. And I would suggest, rather perversely or, even, or strangely, advertising can help keep those costs in check. But it, it better not be the same old crap mass intrusive ad messaging that we that our business has created to date it's got to be of a higher order smarter targeted more relevant that kind of stuff and i think that's that's the the balance that we're we're getting towards now i i think it's another year or two before we sort of clearly see that but i think the the beginnings of that are underway now sorry Thanks. For the let's uh, take some questions from the audience gary you had a question uh, please state your name and affiliation Well, I, you know, I, I, we subscribe to Rentrack, and I think it's a pretty good tool, especially to a programmer, um, because I can see, uh, you know, I come to the office on Monday, and I can see how my programming did on Comcast, right? So I know if I'm doing something right or wrong. But I think from the perspective of an advertiser, it's probably way insufficient information. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I like Rentrack a lot. I like uh, companies like Aaron Media a lot. I like uh, what Atlas is trying to do with, with video on demand. Um, and, and frankly, I don't, I, I, I say bring them on. I mean, Nielsen, if they want to do it, great. Um, uh, the unfortunate thing is, uh, and this is not Rentrack's fault, this is, uh, we don't have access to that data. We're, we're hearing that the programmers now are starting to get that data from Rentrack in a, in a, in a nice digestible, um, you know, web-friendly uh, sort of interface kind of way. But uh, by and large, we advertisers uh, are not privy to that data. RentTrack won't give us access to it because the cable operators will not sh allow them to share it with us, even if we're buying ad messages in those environments. Um, we are unfortunately being held back to uh, what the cable industry responded to our 4A's guidelines about two years ago to four data points. They're calling them four. I call them one and a half, um, one of which is the universe of how many homes have VOD. So uh, you could argue that that's not even a real data point. But we have to get more granular data, and we have to get more buy-in and agreement as to what those data points are. I'm not asking for the world. I'm asking for something other than a Nielsen rating and a cross